What if I were to tell you that a single bundle the size of a wooden log holds enough energy to provide enough electricity for a person's lifetime for 520 years worth of electricity. And that's not an average person across the world. It's an average Canadian. Yes, Canadians are the top fourth consumers of electricity per capita in the world. So in this video, I'm gonna be reviewing a nuclear fuel bundle. Yes, what does it feel like? How does it feel like to hold one of these bad boys? How much does this weigh? Can it be used for bicep curls? And more importantly, what's the special metal that makes up this fuel bundle. Hey friends, my name is Osama. I have a background in nuclear engineering and on this channel, I help demystify nuclear technologies by simplifying them. Let's dive into this video. So like I said, this is a bundle of nuclear fuel. And unfortunately, it would be very difficult for me to get this from a operating nuclear power plant. Yes, as you can imagine, I'd have CSIS, FBI, CIA, the police, everyone come after me if that was the case. But this is luckily a prop replica of a fuel bundle. This prop bundle has the exact feel, design, dimensions, and also materials as that of a real fuel bundle. I've had professors that had to pay around $20,000 to get their hands on one of these replica bundles for experiments. So it's not a cheap toy. If you ever get a chance to hold one of these things, it's actually a little bit smaller than the size of a wooden log. So it's easy to hold, it's portable, you can hold it in one hand, no problem. Also, you see me tossing this thing around on camera, like it's a paperweight. So if you were to hold this yourself, you notice that it's not too heavy. It's it's around a pound or so, but don't be deceived. This is simply a replica bundle. In reality, one of these things, when it's fully loaded with uranium, weighs around 25 kilograms, which is around 60 pounds. Yes, so it's very, very, very heavy. Right now, this is unloaded, all right? It has zero uranium inside of it. It's simply an empty shell, but still has a little bit of weight to it, even being empty. Also, another thing I notice when I hold this in my hand is it makes a bit of a noise, right? and also a little bit squishy when I hold it in my hands, which is pretty interesting feeling. So why is this thing so expensive? And the reason why is because of the metal that it's made out of called zirconium or zirc alloy. The metal that you see on the outside is called a sheath. Yes, like a sword. So in the United States, we call this cladding. The reason why it's called sheath is because it's sheathing the uranium fuel that's kept inside. That's gonna be super hot and act like a fuel, right? And you'll see that this thing is fully sealed. So once it goes into the reactor, it doesn't crack open, it remains sealed from beginning to end. A fresh fuel bundle while it's operating and then once it becomes nuclear waste. Yes, this is how nuclear waste looks like as well. So you'll see that this thing is fully sealed and welded very well. And this also holds hundreds of fuel pellets, all right? The pellets are around the size of this earplug. So around the size of a Canadian quarter or an American quarter, if you want a little bit of a size comparison. All right, so why is this thing made out of zirconium? Well, zirconium is a really good metal used throughout the nuclear industry, especially in nuclear reactors. And the reason why is because it's corrosion resistant, it's very strong, and more importantly, it's invisible to neutrons. So why is this important? Remember, neutrons are the spark that start up a nuclear reaction and keep that reaction going. To get the most energy out of these fuel bundles, you want a metal which doesn't absorb neutrons. Rather, it sends them off to other bundles for nuclear fission to happen even more and more, right? It keeps the reaction going. That's why you can get 520 years of a single person's lifetime electricity from this bundle alone. Fun fact, the word zirconium comes from the Arabic word zargoon, which means gold colored. But what's interesting is that this doesn't really look gold colored. It looks like steel or aluminum, I would say. Zircon rich sediments uh, that are found across the world are mined and the zircon that is recovered is used to produce the zirconium metal. Also within these zircon sediments, you'll find a zircon gemstone. And this gemstone comes in various colors, but the most precious of them is gold colored. That's why in Arabic is zirconium is derived from the word zargoon or gold color. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Also, this metal is also a bit darker in color. And I know you can't really see in this video, but usually the metal itself is zirconium. It oxidizes over time and becomes a bit darker. Actually, the ring that I got for graduating from the nuclear engineering program is actually made out of zirconium. And you'll see a little bit of that dark hue. The real question that you might be wondering is how does this thing work? How does it produce so much energy and ultimately electricity from just one single bundle alone? Well, I'll give you a quick rundown. The way it works is you can actually hold a fresh bundle in your hand. And the reason why is because the bundle has a natural uranium, right? So it's it's a rock that's mined, it's processed, it's made into ceramics and placed inside this bundle.
bundle. So you can hold one of these bundles in hand. It's actually fueled the nuclear reactor by hand. So what you do is you take one of these bundles wearing cotton gloves because you know you want to be fancy, but also uh, you want to make sure that no oils from your hands go on the bundle itself while it's in the reactor. It's pushed in through a fueling machine and it hangs out in the reactor where it sits inside various pressure tubes. So there's hundreds of tubes in a can-do reactor, several hundred, and this is where the fuel is loaded in. Each pressure tube holds around 12 of these bundles. So you can do the math there, how many bundles are in a reactor. Over time, pressurized water is flowing over these bundles. And these bundles are producing heat. Okay, producing a lot of energy and slowly releasing the energy over time. They don't blow up. They cannot blow up, by the way. Okay, I know there's a question that's always asked. Rather, the heat is released slowly and slowly over time. Imagine like a fire log. It slowly releases energy over time. And similarly, these things work the same way, but rather they're boiling large amounts of water to produce steam, spin turbines and create clean electricity. All right, so that's a cool, cool rundown of how these bundles work. Next, I'll break down some of the essential components that make up this fuel bundle. And we'll start off with the bearing pads. All right, so you'll see right over here, these pads. It seems like the surface is raised a bit and you'll see three sets of bearing pads on this bundle. These bearing pads are really important because once they're pushed into a pressure tube, they need to be able to be inserted into the pressure tube safely, but also slide down. So when another bundle is pushed in, the other bundle is able to slide out as well. So you'll see several bearing pads within this bundle. Another really interesting part in this bundle is the end support plate. So you'll see these two plates at each end of the fuel bundle. And these plates are really important because not only are they keeping the bundle together to a certain extent, but also when another fresh bundle is pushed in, it can touch this other bundle and it makes sure that there's separation between the two bundles and also able to handle impact from the other bundle that's coming in. Also, another really cool feature from this bundle that I pointed out before was how well it's sealed, right? The fuel within the nuclear reactor is sealed very, very well and this acts almost like a containment system within a nuclear reactor core. This makes up a large part of the core, by the way, but also you'll see that these things are sealed tight, okay? The welded sealed and rather the heat or the energy produced from the ceramic uranium is transferred to this bundle and then transferred to the water, right? So it's kind of like a pot that you're cooking with. You're not necessarily cooking on the stove itself because that would get dirty. Rather, you're using a pot which is transferring heat from the stove, like an electric stove to that of the pot, which transfers the heat to your food, which allows it to cook, right? So it's interesting how the heat transfer element works. And lastly, there's a component that you can't necessarily see from the surface, but it's in there, which is called can lube. Yes, can lube is a thin graphite layer that's placed inside of these bundles. And the graphite layer sits in between the fuel pellet and the fuel sheet. So the reason why this graphite layer is used because it improves performance of these bundles when it's in a can -do reactor. When I chat with people about nuclear waste, one question that they always have is what does it look like? And this is exactly it. This is one of the waste types, right? Which is the high level waste that comes out of a nuclear reactor. Yes, it's not green. It's not glowing. It doesn't look like sludge. Rather, it's solid. It looks exactly like this, but it's not glowing green. So after the reactor uses up this fuel, how does it become waste? Well, the reactor uses this fuel source, which ultimately then becomes spent fuel. A spent fuel meaning there, it's not worth extracting energy out of this. Although it has a lot of energy trapped inside still, you know, it's it's not economically viable to remove more. Rather, you can send this to a processing facility which can extract other elements like plutonium out of this fuel bundle and then use that for creating more bundles, something that happens across the world, like in countries like France, which process a lot of its spent fuel. But what takes place is this goes into large pools of water, okay, called spent fuel bays, where the fuel sits there for several years where it completely cools down and these pools of water are extracting the heat from this bundle. Next, it's put into large steel concrete containers called dry storage containers. And these dry storage containers hold this fuel while it's dry. Next, this fuel is taken, it's disposed of safely where it's inserted inside copper layered containers and then bentonite clay and ultimately sent off into a deep geological repository. So that's a high, high level overview. And maybe I'll go into depth about this process in another video. All right. So 
Also, how many of these can you find in Canada? Well, around 60 years of operation of nuclear reactors in Canada produced 3 million fuel bundles. Yes, 3 million fuel bundles. So if you were to visualize this, 3 million of these would be eight hockey rinks full of fuel bundles from the bottom of the ice to the surface boards at the top. It's not a lot of fuel. Since the fuel bundles are energy dense, you don't need a lot of spent fuel to power a whole nation. But take into consideration that a lot of the nuclear reactors in Canada are found in Ontario, which still right now gets a majority of its electricity from nuclear reactors. So nuclear fuel is awesome. It's energy dense. It produces zero greenhouse gas emissions while in a nuclear reactor. And also it can be safely stored and managed very effectively. So that's why I'm a big fan of nuclear fuel. Hope you enjoyed this video and hope you get a chance to check out some of my other videos like my can do reactor videos. So start learning about the reactor that uses these bundles of fuel. Hope you enjoyed this video. Till then, take care. Bye.